Hey everyone, thank you so much for checking out another episode of the WeVA podcast. This is a super exciting episode of the WeVA podcast. We have a research scientist for Meta AI, Matisse Duze. Uh, his research publication list is just amazing. The amount of work he's done in the space of uh, vector analysis, product quantization, all sorts of things in deep learning, really. It's, he's really truly one of the most impressive scientists I've had the opportunity to talk to. So Matisse, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Yeah, thank you very much for hosting me. Awesome. So could we kick this off by telling us about the history of the research? Uh, like, how did you come to be working on these things? What first inspired your interest? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I can say a little bit about my background. So um, I have a PhD in uh, computer vision, basically. So that's my background. Uh, I did it in, uh, in France. And uh, then I moved to, um, to a research uh, institution, the, which is INRIA, and uh, where I met uh, Hervé Jégou, who he has an expertise more in uh, anything related to uh, coding, uh, encoding, decoding, the kind of things that's used for uh, GSM networks. And, uh, and so um, he was the main inspiration to move towards thinking about uh, how to better compress, uh, compress, uh, compress vectors. Uh, because basically there's one very clear uh, application for this in uh, computer vision at the time that was very important, which is that uh, images were analyzed by extracting SIFT features from them. And SIFT features are just um, 128 dimensional vectors uh, that are, uh, and you extract uh, in the order of a th a hundred to a thousand per image. And uh, those, um, those were early embeddings. So that means that it's a representation of a small part of the image. And then you could do a couple of things with those. You could uh, use them for image classification. But the, the part that we are most interested in was uh, image indexing, which means, uh, which meant at the time and still means now, uh, finding uh, similar images, for example, images that represent the same object or the same building. And to do that, you had to um, you had to find which were the nearest embeddings, the nearest SIFT vectors from the ones that are on the other image. And so there was this, um, <clears throat> at the time, there was this very interesting work um, that came from, uh, from the Andrew Zissman's lab, and, uh, uh, and which, which was basically led by uh, Joseph Sivich, and uh, which basically uh, reduced this bunch, this big number of SIFT vectors. So you had like, like a thousand SIFT vectors for one image, which was pretty heavy. And to reduce that into a bag of words. And bag of words just means uh, that you reduce each uh, vector into a single identifier, a single, uh, a single number that was um, assigned by nearest neighbor, uh, nearest neighbor search. So searching the nearest centroid to each of the vectors and just keeping that only information about the vector. And so that means that if you had, um, if you had uh, uh, like, uh, uh, say, 1,000 centroids, uh, you would have the only information that you keep from all those heavy SIFT vectors in the, on the image is a kind of histogram over the 1,000 centroids about how many uh, SIFT vectors were falling into those uh, SIFT vectors. So, uh, the, and it was called um, uh, a bag of, a bag of uh, visual words uh, because in a sense, by analogy with uh, text, you would reduce the 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 you know the continuous space of the the SIF vectors into a single uh, a single token, a single uh, a single word, uh, and that represented the image. And then the images could be compared. And the, basically, the, what what happened there is that uh, this this back of word representation that was used for many uh, many applications, including classification, but what it also enabled was uh, to be able to, um, to do large-scale indexing. So that means since it's so compact, you could say, okay, I have, uh, I have uh, 10,000, uh, 100,000, a million. I think before us, the, the largest uh, application that was uh, at scale 1 million, uh, 1 million uh, images, and you could index those. And that was, that was quite novel at the time. Uh, that it was possible to really find in, in real time. So there was a, a work um, that was coming from uh, Nista and Stevenius, 
where they basically had a, a collection of CD covers and uh, they were showing it to a webcam and the webcam would find in real time uh, what, where those, uh, covers, uh, what those covers were corresponding to. And this was really enabled by this, uh, this uh, bag of words representation. So that was, so the bag of words representation was used uh, uh, quite extensively at the time and uh, it has been expanded and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, what, I, what the, the second or the, the innovation that came from this uh, work by, uh, by Sevich and Zisselman was the fact that they used an inverted index. So that means uh, it's inverted because you start from, uh, from, um, from, from those, uh, those histograms of, uh, of visual words. And instead of stacking those histograms of visual words, you invert the index and you, for each visual word index, you record which images and uh, contain that particular, particular vis visual word. And uh, so that made it much faster uh, because uh, what it enables is that if you increase the number or the, the size of the visual vocabulary, uh, so instead of having a thousand, you can say I have 10,000, 100,000, et cetera, uh, you can you you get a very sparse uh, sparse histograms obviously, uh, and that means that the inverted index uh, when you actually want to find uh, which visual words are in common between a query image and a database image, uh, you need to visit fewer a, a very small fraction of that uh, of that data set. So that was um, so I think. That, that was a bit the background when we arrived. So the, the key elements that we had there uh, was uh, the, the fact that we had, um, we had this representation of uh, high dimensional vectors with a sin single integer, which is exactly quantization. And so that's where you know, the expertise of Hervé uh, started to be very useful. And we have this inverted file structure that uh, was the start of a lot of fruitful um, indexing methods that were developed later, including the ones that we developed. So then we arrived, and uh, so we we recognized this uh, the quality of this uh, of this inverted list and the, the potential the, the potential that it had to do large scale indexing, and um, and so what we added to that the first the first thing we added is actually. Uh, thinking that within those inverted lists, so the inverted lists uh, in the in the in the initial um, uh, back of visual word representations contained only the document IDs or the the image IDs that contained the, those specific visual words, and so the idea that we came with um, was to add a kind of payload uh, for each of those uh, instances where we kind of refine a little bit. Uh, the representation of the of the the vectors because uh, because representing a 128 dimensional vector by a single integer is a very crude quantization and so what we did at the time is that we we used uh, a pretty standard uh, um, uh, system that existed at the time and it was uh, uh, it was to do a kind of binarization and that we called Hamming embedding and so Hamming embedding basically consists in uh, taking this 128 dimensional vector, applying a random rotation to it, and then keeping the sign of each of the components after rotation. And so then we get a binary vector, uh, which uh, at the time we didn't use the full 128 dimensions, but we used just 64. And then we had a binary representation of 64 bits. And we could do that both on the query side and on the database side. And then comparing binary vectors, it's very very efficient to uh, to uh, compute the, to compare those with Hamming distances, and so then then we had um, uh, we had a, an image indexing system that was very efficient and that was based on uh, on uh, what currently we would call an IVF an inverted file and a Hamming embedding so a, a, a binary representation of the of the, the the vectors that are stored within that inverted file. So that was the first stage, and we got we. It was very successful in terms of uh, of large scale image indexing. I remember redoing the demo with the webcam uh, with uh, with a laptop and uh, 
uh, and uh, and a webcam and uh, and I'd scale 10 million images and I had an external hard drive, which uh, so for the technical details, which which didn't have a partition at all on it, and so there was no file system because we needed to access very quickly. We needed to access the images to display the results, so we were accessing directly the offset on the disk uh, of the the actual images, and uh, and this was this was working pretty well and. Um, and so that was the first uh, iteration of uh, of uh, of uh, of this combination of um, of the the IDF, which where the objective is really to 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 very quickly prune the data set or the parts of the data set where you need to search, and an encoding method uh, whose objective is to get an approximate reasonable or as good as possible approximation of the of the um, of the of the vectors, so it, it turns out that so at the time there was the the there was a lot of work around binary representations for for vectors. So uh, there was a whole literature around uh, locality locality sensitive hashing, uh, which it which is not exactly uh, the same as a binary representation, but very often a binary representation is uh, is based on the locality sensitive hashing uh, uh, theory. And um, and so that there were interesting theoretical properties, uh, and uh, so there was uh, uh, spectral hashing, uh, which was a work by Toralba, and uh, so there was a literature around that. And uh, but what we so there the expertise of Hervé uh, that he had uh, for for anything related to quantization uh, came in very useful uh, because he knew and. It became clear afterwards that actually uh, binarization is a very crude uh, way of uh, of doing quantization. So basically, it is quantization because uh, you you transform a, a continuous signal into into uh, an integer, uh, basically. Uh, but there are much better ways of uh, of or much less lossy ways of uh, encoding vectors than doing uh, than doing binarization. So there, maybe we can go a little bit into the theory of um, of uh, uh, quantization. So uh, the part that I know of, I'm, I can't say I'm much of an expert, but I got I get, got some experience and some very basic principles. So the the first um, the first uh, two principles are uh, the Lloyd principles. So uh, for quantization and. Uh, Basically, since you since you map a continuous signal to or a continu continuous vector, continuous high dimensional vector to um, to uh, to one single uh, uh, representation, so to one single integer, then and you always have a reconstruction of that uh, of of the approximation of the of the of the vector. And so, uh, so in order for this approximation to be uh, to be optimal, there are uh, there are two necessary and non, not sufficient, but necessary condi conditions. And the first one is that each, they are very natural. The first one is that when you have a vector and when you look at the whole set of possible reconstructions that you can make with your quantizer, so the, what that we call centroids in general, uh, then uh, the, uh, uh, the vector should be assigned to the nearest centroid. So it, uh, if you pick one a centroid that is not the nearest, then by definition you are doing something suboptimal. So you always should always assign to the nearest vector. And the second one, uh, so so this is quite natural. The second one is specific to the to the to the L2 distance, to the Euclidean distance. If you minimize the the if you minimize the 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 squared uh, error of the reconstruction, uh, then each centroid should be the center of mass of all the vectors that are assigned to it in the distribution. And uh, uh, so those, those are two principles. And the, actually, the very nice thing of, uh, of, this, uh, of those two principles is that it translates to uh, the k-means, which is also called the Lloyd's, Lloyd's algorithm, to, uh, to, do, uh, to do clustering and afterwards to do quantization. Because the k-means is an uh, Basically, what you do is you, you take a training set that you suppose is representative of the of the data distribution, and then you 
you, you alternate between two steps. The first one is to estimate, or let's start with the assignment. So you start with a set of, of initial centroids that are determined with uh, some heuristic or randomly. And then you, you assign to each, uh, you assign each training vector to the nearest centroid so that you, you, you basically you do the assignment step. And uh, the second step is you update the centroids by, by computing the center of mass of all the points that were assigned to that, uh, that centroid. So k-means is, uh, is one of the huge successes of, uh, of, uh, of quantization and of uh, many machine learning uh, algorithms. It's very simple. And, um, and actually, it, it, gives you, uh, it, it gives you a quantizer if you have representative training points. It gives you a quantizer that is that has that follows those two properties of the the, the opt optimality of the of the two Lloyd Lloyd conditions, and um, so what's so this is very good. So what's the problem with k-means? The problem is that uh, say that you you have budget to um, to represent a vector with uh, sixty four bits, so. Uh, what happens is that you cannot really say, okay, I'm going to do a, a k-means where the, the indices are going to be encoded into 64 bits because 64, 2 to the 64, it's really a lot of centroids. It's actually more than uh, much of, uh, of the high numbers that we find in, uh, in modern computer science. So, so it's just not possible. It's not possible to, do this, to use this amazing uh, k-means algorithm at that scale. It is possible, and that's what we do, to use it for IVF for coarse quantization. So for, for inverted files, uh, we have the, the degree of freedom to choose the number of centroids that we want to use. And in general, it is beneficial to use a large number of centroids, uh, but uh, we're not going to, to have two to the 24, two to the 64 centroids. We're going to have like uh, between uh, uh, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, this, this order of magnitude number of centroids. So for this, we can use k-means directly, and we definitely do that, uh, to, to, to do this first step of what we call coarse quantization. So the, the, the inverted file that's going to, to allow us to, to search only a really small, hopefully a small subset of the data set and still not lose too much accuracy uh, in this process. But when, we, when, we, when we're talking about the payload, so the, the, the part that you're going to use to approximate the vector and that you store in the inverted lists, uh, then you, you cannot, you, I mean, if you have a payload of eight bits, it's fine. But in general, you have a larger payload. And the reason is because it doesn't make much sense to have eight bits uh, because the, even the image identifier is going to be longer than that. And that's, that, and that's also stored in the inverted list. And so uh, if we want to go to 64 bits, then uh, so the, the, the fundamental idea of the product quantization, uh, which already existed but was never used for a similarity search per se, uh, the idea there is to, is to say, okay, we cannot really afford to do a 64 bits by... Uh, by having a vocabulary that that spans that has one explicit centroid stored for every uh, for every uh, uh, centroid of the two to to the sixty four, so what we're going to do we're going to do uh, a trade off. We're going to just uh, chunk or to we're going to take the vector, the input vector, and split it into sub vectors, and then apply this quantization, this k-means quantization, or uh, this exhaustive quantization, apply it only on the sub-vectors. And this is, um, it's, 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 it solves our problem uh, of scale, uh, because let's say if we need 64 bits, uh, let's say that we can uh, split those in eight times eight bits, in eight sub-vectors that each are encoded in eight bits, and then doing the k-means for to get eight-bit vectors, it's just the k-means with the 256 centroids. And this is, I mean, this is you could almost do it by hand. And um, and then uh, to and then you can encode each of those sub-vectors into separate uh, into a separate uh, representation. 
and then just concatenate those representations and uh, and you get an approximation of the, the vector. So uh, so then we are down to uh, to having um, to having uh, an encoding cost that's very reasonable because at encoding time what you need to do is is exhaustively find the nearest centroid for each of the sub vectors. But since you need to search only two hundred and fifty six centroids, it's uh, it's pretty efficient, and. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the storage, the other problem was the storage of the centroids. This, and since you need to store only small centroids in, uh, in, in, uh, for each of the, uh, for each of the sub vectors, it's, it's pretty efficient. Actually, uh, the storing the centroids is as large as storing 256 vectors themselves. Uh, because if you add the sizes of the sub vectors, you end up with uh, the initial size of the data vectors. So that was that was uh, very interesting in terms of storage and in terms of assignment. And so decoding is just a lookup, and you separately look up each of the vectors. And one very interesting property that we already that we also had, and that uh, that was kind of lucky that uh, it turns out this way, is that it's also possible uh, to do compressed domain distance computations. So compressed domain distance computations means that if you have a query vector, um, so in general, I wouldn't say in general, but very often you want to compress the database because it's size constrained, but the query vectors come as a flow, so you don't really need to compress them. And so, um, and so what you can do there is to, so the, the basic algorithm that you would do with, uh, with uh, an IVF and, and the PQ, or with the PQ, PQ payload to compute those distances is to take the query vectors that are not compressed, decompress the, the database vectors, or you scan the inverted list, you decompress each of the vectors, and then you compute the distance just by computing your L2 distance. And, and so that's fine. But it turns out that it, there's something even more efficient that you can do is not decompressing the, the, the database vectors at all, but when you know, at the point when you know the query vector, you can, you can say, okay, uh, for each of the sub vectors of those query vectors, I have only 256 possible di uh, dimensions because uh, there are 256 centroids. And so I can, I can just, instead of computing it every time, uh, you can just say, okay, I only have 256 possibilities. So I just need to compute those distance, all those 256 distances. And when I'm scanning, I'm just you know, looking up those distances and, and compute what's the, what's the and, and then I don't need to compute, actually compute the distance. And this is possible. Uh, so it's possible to do that with, uh, with any quantizer. You can compute the distances with all the centroids. And since it's a finite number of centroids, you, you always know that uh, it, you, you, you will have pre-computed the distances. Uh, but what makes this possible with uh, the product quantizer is, or what, what's convenient with the product quantizer is that uh, the distances decompose across dimensions with L2 distance or with L1 distance or with many distances. Actually, you, you can, uh, when you, you, you can chunk the, the, the vectors into parts and uh, summing up the distances in the sub, in the sub parts to get uh, the total distance between the, between the vectors. And so that's, or I mean, it's not true for L2 distance, it's, square, it's too true for squared L2 distance. And so we always compute squared L2 distance. And so, and so in those sub vectors, then uh, uh, we, were, um, we, uh, we were adding together the sub vectors, uh, the distance of the sub vectors. And, and, and basically when we have 64 uh, bits, uh, a 64 bits representation, we have, uh, we just have, uh, uh, a lookup to do for every of the sub vectors when we compute distances, and um, and then sum summing them together. So that's for uh, to do one distance computation instead of doing a decompression plus plus uh, plus uh, L two distance. What we do is we do eight lookups and seven additions to get the the actual result. So um, okay, so that's that was the principle of uh, prod quantization. Uh, so I, I'm, I see that I'm kind of diverging a little bit from the history part. So let's go back to, back to the, the history of uh, product quantization. Uh, 
So basically, this uh, this all happened in the so that that was back in two thousand nine, I think. So and this was all you know uh, generated by the by the the the, the brain of uh, Hervé, and so I was implementing, and uh, together we we made a we made a paper about this uh, that we submitted to the journal to PAMI. So that was the uh, the IVF. Uh, so it's it, it was a product quantization paper which contains both the idea of doing uh, product quantization. So it's called yeah. By the way, it's called a product quantization because you have a product space when you have sub vectors like this. It's like when you look at it uh, from a, a space uh, perspective, you basically have um, a Cartesian product of the subspaces, and uh, so that's why it's called a product quantization. Uh, but uh, but the the term wasn't inv wasn't invented by by us. It it, it existed before. It's a uh, it's uh, relatively classic in the in the coding literature. So uh, we published this paper, and um, and so there were um, uh, so it, we we compared it uh, with uh, what we had previously, the our Hamming embedding method. Uh, so, which was based on, uh, on on binary representations, and um, and it turns out so uh, it turns out that it was it was very fast, and uh, I think I think at the time at the time maybe the it it was so we were quite convinced that it was a very good method, but in the end it took a very long time uh, be before. Before uh, people actually realized that uh, that uh, binary representations are are um, are just suboptimal, so it, it it's uh, so I, I think much of the story afterwards was a kind of fight. Well, I, I, it was a very you know very polite fight, but still, it it, it took it took a lot of education to uh, to to. To convey this message that despite the huge um, amount of literature and theoretical results that uh, there is around uh, localized sensitive hashing, uh, that binary representations are just too crude uh, to be uh, to be efficient uh, because uh, because their their representation uh, p uh, capabilities are insufficient. I mean, it's it's just you, you cannot. Um, you cannot you cannot even look at the at the Lloyd's optimality conditions. Uh, basically, a binary representation in its best form would be so that's interesting. Actually, it would be a product quantization where uh, you have a single bit per uh, uh, you have sub vectors of size one, so that's a scalar, and you have one bit per per sub vector, and so it's a very special case of product quantization with a very crude way of comparing them if you use Hamming distances. But you, there are extensions of binary re representations where you actually do um, you do uh, asymmetric uh, binary search. So the same, you you don't encode or you don't take the binary representation of the query vector, but you you take the uh, you take the floating point vector and you can uh, you can uh, make it so that uh, uh, that you can get a floating point distance. But then you you kind of lose the advantage of doing very quick uh, uh, having distance comparisons in the binary domain. Okay, so to, to come back to the history, so uh, the 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 product quantization uh, basically it's uh, we we we've done we and then other people have done many follow-ups in that field, and so the follow-ups are. Are interesting. I think that um, so there, since there are two components of uh, of uh, of the uh, of the the what we call IVF PQ, so inverted file plus PQ payload representation. Uh, so there have been uh, improvements on both sides, uh, on both of the on the IVF side, so the, the inverted file representation, and on the PQ representation. Uh, so. Uh, so before we start, so I'm going to kind of to reattach this to the history. I can say what what happened before uh, before uh, we started on the the face library, which is uh, which what the big software and un un undertaking. So at the time, so in terms of software, let's talk a bit about software. So 
uh, back in uh, in 2000, uh, 2009, we we produced a software that was called PQ Codes and that implemented all of this uh, in in uh, in C plus and um, no in C actually, but because we had an version of C plus at the time, uh, which I to a certain extent I still have, and uh, so it was in C and but it was a closed source library because um, we decided that uh, we wanted to sell it and. Uh, uh, and at the time, it was not so clear that you could and be open source and sell something. So it was closed source. So, and we sold it to uh, to a few companies that were using it for uh, for large scale indexing. Uh, so, uh, uh, what happened? Uh, so that's what. So, in in a sense, I think that the fact, I I think back in the time, people were not doing that much uh, uh, open sourcing. Uh, even in the research domain, it was not at all obvious that uh, that if you if you found something or if you published a paper, you you'd open source it. And uh, we didn't do that. We didn't do that for several uh, for several uh, of the papers. And um, and maybe at the time it was not that clear as well that uh, open sourcing is is just a, a royal way to increase the impact of papers. And um, and so we we kind of uh, uh, we kind of expected that people would be re-implementing it and uh, that that would be enough. But uh, so th- I, I think this is something that really flipped in the, in the last uh, in the last maybe ten years or so. Um, and so so what what happened is that uh, there were PQ implementations that started to pop up. Uh, so uh, at Microsoft, uh, at uh, Google had an early PQ implementation as well. And so the the improvement and but um, in this in this in this that it was still not clear at the time there was no real uh, very big uh, or established benchmark for uh, for uh, for for nearest neighbor search and and basically the the open sourcing of those methods came in parallel with benchmarks uh, that were established to. Uh, to actually really compare them and uh, to to make the state of the art clear. Uh, so, but so that that's that's uh, that's something that happens on the software uh, and on the and on the you know on the on the adoption side of uh, of things. So, what happened? So, I can say a few words about uh, what happened in research uh, around um, the inverted files on the one hand and on the PQ on the other hand. So um, one of the one of the the main pain points of uh, the IVFPQ method was that um, that the first level coarse quantization was uh, was uh, was a limiting factor uh, because if you want to index more vectors you need to have a larger um, a larger vocabulary. So let, I can explain this a little bit. So. Uh, basically, uh, when you do a search in, a, in an IVFPQ uh, uh, index, there are two components of, this, of the search time. And uh, the first one is to do the coarse quantization. So taking the query vectors, uh, the query vector and determining which uh, inverted lists must be visited. And so that boils down to finding the top. So it's in face, it's called n probe, the top n probe number of uh, inverted lists that need to be visited and uh, so that's the first stage and it's it is also a, a nearest neighbor search problem uh, because you find the nearest neighbors of the, the of the query vector and the second uh, the second stage is to do um, is to actually scan those inverted lists and compute the distances uh, using those lookup tables and uh, so it turns out so you need to find a balance between those two costs and uh, the the uh, it it turns out that uh, when you scale the data set to larger sizes, uh, in general, the number of centroids needs to scale as the square root of the number of uh, of the number of vectors that you want to index, because uh, if you scale it as fast as the number of cent- or if you don't scale it at all, then the inverted list will just grow proportionally to the number of vectors. So it, so the cost is going to be proportional to the um, or the scanning cost is going to be proportional to the uh, to the search time uh, to, to the number of vectors, uh, but and if you if you scale the number of centroids as quickly as the number of vectors, on the other hand, then the inverted lists stay 
about as long, but uh, the coarse quantization cost is going to scale uh, linearly with uh, the number of vectors. And so to avoid this, you kind of spread the effort onto both of them. And to do this, uh, a rule of thumb is to, uh, is to scale it uh, as, the, as the square root. So if you scale it as a square root, when you start getting to 1 billion vectors, uh, it's uh, starting to be a bit slow uh, because you're uh, in the order of 100,000 vectors, uh, maybe a million. In general, it's a bit larger, so it's, it might be a million. And if you have a million centroids to compare with, uh, it, becomes, uh, it becomes slow. And so uh, there have been uh, several, uh, several propositions to improve this, uh, improve this course a quantization cost. And the first one, which was quite clever, actually, it was um, a method, method by um, uh, Babenko and Lempitsky, which consisted in, uh, uh, in breaking down the, 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 the or uh, choosing the centroids as the representation space of a product quantization itself. So to make it very clear, if you, if you want to have 1 million centroids, you say, okay, I, I have um, I have a thousand uh, centroids for the first half of the vector, and I have a thousand centroids for the second half of the vector. And then I, uh, if I take again the the, prod the Cartesian product of those uh, two sets, I get a million centroids, and I can do efficient uh, efficient uh, 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 lookup to lookups or if efficient nearest neighbor searches to find the nearest centroids of the, the query vector. So this, this was the first um, quite, uh, quite effective uh, way of, um, of finding the nearest neighbors or, or, or doing efficient uh, course quantization. Um, or maybe there was an earlier one which was doing hierarchical k-means, which is also quite natural. So that means if you, have a, if you want to have a million, uh, a million uh, centroids, you, you start by, by, by doing a k-means in 1,000, and then within each of those uh, clusters, you do again 1,000. And um, so both, so remember that, uh, that the k-means is, in some respect, it, it is the optimal, well, if k-means found the global optimum, which is not true, but which is a good approximation, k-means gets you the best set of centroids that you can find. But uh, given that you, you need to find a trade-off between speed and accuracy, uh, those two methods, doing hierarchical quantization or hierarchical uh, k-means, and doing the doing the, the 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 what's what's what they call the inverted multi-index, which means uh, finding the uh, finding the two subvectors and uh, handling those separately. It was um, it was uh, it, it was also a good option that that stayed the best uh, the best course quantizer, I think, for large-scale applications until. Uh, until uh, around 2017 or 2018, and uh, and uh, when people realized that you could, as coarse quantizer, you could use to use uh, graph-based methods uh, to do uh, to do um, similarity search. So I know that you already had a whole podcast about graph-based methods, and uh, uh, so maybe I can say a little bit how this includes in this uh, in this story about. Uh, about inverted files and uh, product quantization. So uh, basically, uh, graph-based methods are, are very, very fast and accurate. Uh, they are not very scalable uh, because there's a very big overhead to store the graphs themselves. But yeah, so the graph-based methods, they, um, so, uh, they're, they, are very, um, they are very fast and accurate, uh, but they have a scalability issue because uh, storing, the, storing the, the graph structure itself uh, becomes uh, scales uh, linearly with uh, the size of the data set and, uh, uh, and it becomes a dominant cost at, uh, uh, when, when, the data set, uh, when the data set becomes larger, it, it becomes a problematic. Basically, I mean, it's, it's always the same problem in operations research. Uh, once, uh, when a problem doesn't, is, is not a limit, you ignore it, but once uh, one is, it becomes when it becomes a limiting factor, you you start worrying about it, and uh, so basically, yeah. So uh, the uh, so in particular HNSW, which is really a very impressive algorithm, uh, it's it scales at the size of 
uh, of a million, maybe 10 million, but beyond it's, it's very low, slow to build and, uh, and, and it takes just a, a huge amount of memory. And so, um, so, so HNSW is actually, um, but this makes it the perfect candidate for, for, uh, coarse quantization. And, uh, I think that, um, uh, so, um, uh, the same Babenko and Yuri, they made uh, they made a paper about using it as a cross quantizer, and it's it it is very good, and that's uh, that's how the the graph based methods can be included into um, into the IVFPQ uh, system. So th that's what so that's about the cross quantization, uh, and basically what happens is that um, every improvement that we have on this task of nearest neighbor search. It can be applied to cross uh, quantizers, and so that's and quite it's quite easy to uh, to inject those improvements into uh, into the um, into the IVFPQ framework. So uh, that's about the cross quantizer. Then we have the the um, the product quantizer. So there were um, there were several improvements over the over the um, uh, over the co the core uh, product quantizer. The first um maybe the well maybe the first one is is to just do re-ranking so basically using a product quantizer as a first approximation uh, that gives you the top say that you need the top 10 results then you find the nearest neighbors with uh, with with ivfpq and you take the top 100 and then uh, you you compute exact distances or distances with a better approximation for the top 100 and keep only the top 10 and this is this is really a very effective method. It's 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 really what uh, enables you to get a, a good recall at one, so really get the the, the good results at the very first uh, for as the very first search result, um, um, without impacting too much the the, the search uh, time. Uh, the problem is that you need to some auxiliary storage, which might be RAM, but uh, it could be disk also or SSD. Uh, to store the, the the high quality approximation of the vectors or the full vectors. So that's the that's the first thing. Uh, then uh, there were some uh, there were some attempts to improve the um, to improve the the quality of the product quantizer. Uh, and the first problem of the product quantizer is that it arbitrarily uh, chunks the vector into into subsections. And um, if you, if if it so happens that in your data set, all of the variance of the data set is only in the last ten components of your thousand-dimensional vectors, then you are allocating a lot of bits or a lot of uh, uh, encoding capacity to the first parts of the vector, and those are completely lost. And uh, so um, there's one uh, very simple and in the end fruitful method that was uh, applied on the product quantizer, which is called optim optimized um, product quantization, which was a, an early weight work by Kenning He who in the end became the, or the very successful uh, um, uh, architecture or, or CNN architecture developer that we, that we know and he works at Meta now. And that, uh, that method consisted in applying or finding and applying uh, a random, uh, not uh, random, but uh, a rotation to the input vectors, so that the the energy in each uh, sub vector was balanced. Uh, the objective was to uh, find this uh, this rotation so that the 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 energy was spread equally across the sub vectors, and um, and since it's a, a rotation, a rotation doesn't change the the Euclidean distance, so it's uh, you don't see it on the Euclidean distance. And this is really useful for many uh, many distributions that wouldn't naturally be uh, well balanced. Uh, so then then there was uh, maybe worth mentioning the LOPQ method, which is a locally optimized PQ method, uh, and this one consists, uh, but this is specific to uh, or it, it it applies on an IVFPQ index, and basically the problem with the IVFPQ index is that um, each each um, each uh, uh, in each event inverted list you use the same PQ the same trained uh, product quantizer uh, to uh, to encode what's in those inverted lists and this it's a bit it's a bit unnatural because in fact uh, since 
the role of those uh, inverted lists is, is to make cells. So it makes cells in the embedding space. And so uh, you could say that uh, points where you already know that they fall into one of those cells, they, are probably, they don't, probably don't have the same data distribution as if they fall in another cell. And so what LOPQ does is that it trains a, um, a product quantizer separately for each of the cells. So the, but then there's a trade-off uh, because it's expensive to train because you need to, to store all this information for, separately for each of the cells. But it brings a, 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 fair, a fair improvement of the, of the recalls um, uh, on, on, on most data sets. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so maybe, so I'm going to continue a bit with the history because here we are about at uh, 2015. So 2015, um, Hervé and I joined Facebook. So Facebook is the old name of Meta, maybe you remember. And, uh, uh, and we joined Facebook uh, that was opening an office in, uh, in Paris. And uh, so uh, we basically moved to, to Paris. And, uh, and basically, it was pretty clear since the beginning uh, that we needed to do something about uh, nearest neighbor search in Facebook uh, for production systems because uh, the the systems were very far from the state of the art and um, and so uh, this needed to be improved and uh, so and so when so Hervé arrived I think six or seven months before I arrived and he had already started with this face project and uh, which means uh, Facebook AI similarity search and uh, so uh, so then we um, so so we arrived there and um, and so we 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 started to, uh, creating this uh, piece of software called Face uh, Facebook AI Similarity Search. Um, and basically, um, uh, we since since the start we said we wanted to be open source and uh, uh, and added, so uh, the head of um, of uh, Facebook. Uh, uh, AI was um, Facebook AI research was uh, Yann McCann and he was very supportive of that. Of that. And so uh, and so we started working on uh, on Face. And uh, so we uh, and basically, or I mean, I arrived after and Hervé had started implementing it in C because you know um, because C plus plus is uh, is too complicated. So uh, so, but the people in production they were, they were telling us, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, it's already complicated. We don't want to have this in C. So, so, so I rewrote it in C++ and I, I took over uh, the, as, as the lead developer of FACE uh, pretty quickly. At the time, there was, um, uh, there was a, um, everybody was using Lua as the scripting language. And uh, so there was a scripting language bridge uh, with uh, FACE. Uh, that remained internal until uh, 2017, I think. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I, my personal taste is that Lua is really crappy language. It's, uh, and so uh, I was pretty happy when, uh, so I, I did Python interface for face uh, quite quickly and uh, using Swig. And, um, and I kind of, and in the end, we, when everybody switched over from Lua to Python, when uh, PyTorch was created, uh, we kind of uh, forgot about the Lua, uh, the Lua interface, which is a good riddance. And um, uh, and so, and one important uh, aspect of this is that uh, there was an engineer at uh, at uh, Fair, uh, Jeff Johnson. He's uh, one of the oldest members of um, of Fair in terms of uh, you know number of years at Facebook. And, uh, and he got, it, the, this library caught his interest and he decided to do uh, um, a GPU version of it. So GPU meaning NVIDIA GPU, because I mean, that's kind of the standard uh, at uh, Facebook. And he started developing this. And um, I think it was, a, it was a pretty interesting project uh, for him because, uh, because there were several aspects or the, the algorithms were not, not uh, out of, out, out of reach in terms of optimization on, on GPUs, which sometimes, hap sometimes happens. If there's really a too irregular uh, behavior or uh, graph algorithms are very hard to optimize on GPUs. But this problem of optimizing IVFPQ uh, is, was actually pretty, 
pretty uh, pretty reachable for, uh, for for GPUs. And he, so he made a very efficient uh, GPU method. And uh, actually, it turns out that we decided to publish a paper about face, uh, and uh, the it was clear that the flag the flagship property that we want to showcase for face was the the GPU uh, uh, the GPU implementation. Um, and so, so yeah, that, that was in 2016. Uh, then 2017, start, we started to negotiate when we would actually be allowed. So there were two aspects to this. The first one was internal adoption. So uh, there was a lot of work that, uh, that Hervé was very much involved in, in explaining to, uh, uh, to prod people at Facebook how interesting it was to have, uh, to have this, to use this library, to use... Uh, uh, quantization-based methods to do similarity search, and uh, on the uh, on the other hand, there was uh, uh, there was the external impact. So that means how are we going to open source it? And actually, it took us quite a lot of time to convince um, to convince uh, our management. Uh, well, first to uh, to open source that was not, not so much of a problem, but the real problem was to get it to open source it with a uh, with a uh, MIT license. Uh, and basically, uh, so this is something. Well, open sourcing was really something I discovered when I arrived at uh, at uh, Facebook. It's uh, it is actually it is very hard for companies to for other companies to adopt open source software that that doesn't have a very permissive license, uh, because uh, you know, for example, uh, the GPL is not possible because it's 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 it contaminates and so and so. We, when we initially open sourced the, the library in, with uh, the Creative Commons and non-commercial applications, the companies we talked with told us we cannot use it, and so which makes sense. And so we can we went back to our management saying, we want to have we want this library to have real impact, and so if we want that, we need to open source it in uh, with a permissive license, and so this. Took a long time to negotiate, but in the end, we were allowed to open source it that way. And uh, and so, uh, basically, I think that um, our point was that the similarity search space was not uh, mature yet. So that at the time in twenty around twenty seventeen, it was like uh, people were using uh, Flan, uh, they were using uh, Annoy, they were using. Uh, this kind of libraries, which in our um, in our opinion were, I mean, not state of the art compared to what what you already had in research for several years, and so uh, having an, a strong, um, solid open source library, uh, which with more or less industrial support and uh, that, that could could have a large impact, and so um, so then we uh, we we were allowed to open source it with uh, the, so we got the, the the proper license that we wanted and um, and basically then uh, then that I mean that ball was rolling and um, so after that uh, the history of uh, face was um, several stages of uh, additions of several methods so uh, the first one being HNSW so it, it became uh, when the when that uh, work uh, came out it, it became pretty clear that it covered a kind of uh, a space of operating points where we were really far from uh, the state of the art so uh, so we implemented or I implemented HNSW into face um, then there was and um, so uh, there was uh, uh, um, uh, so there was uh, th this method so the, so this is interesting one one uh, one uh, so when you look at how uh, IVF PQ, PQ works, uh, so you, you have the problems of the cross quantization, and the second part is how to optimize the scanning of the inverted lists, which is the second uh, part of the cost. And the second part of the cost, you basically it's the, the cost is dominated by uh, by the memory lookups into the lookup tables. So you have lookup tables, you do lookups, and the problem is that uh, that modern processes are not at all efficient for lookups. They are efficient for arithmetic uh, throughput, but not for lookups. And so, um, so what we did, it, so it's not what we did, but uh, there, there has been a, a line of research around uh, 
uh, storing those lookups in SIMD registers. And, um, and uh, so the, there's early work by, uh, by uh, people from uh, Technicolor. Um, um, I'm thinking of uh, a guy nom- named André. And um, they basically explored this, this direction. And, uh, but the, the industrial application of this was uh, the, the scan uh, algorithm or the scan uh, library, uh, which was recently open sourced by Google. And basically, they have a very, very, very cleverly optimized uh, uh, IVFPQ implementation where, uh, the, where the, the lookups or the lookup tables are stored in registers and where the whole process of, uh, of computing distances is very well optimized. And uh, so they they had very good operating points, and so uh, and so we also imported this into uh, into uh, into phase. So that's uh, that's a bit uh, of what we did, and I think in terms of so let to, to come back to uh, to uh, to the quantization, which is uh, uh, one of the the main the main topics uh, uh, of of phase, and also of uh, of what we were discussing. Uh, so the quantization currently, what we're looking into is uh, so we have the product quantization, but um, uh, actually, it's there. There are quantization methods that get better accuracy uh, because uh, product quantization has this restriction that each sub vector is encoded separately, and so uh, so th- we lose the kind of uh, statistical dependence between the sub vectors, even if we do an, an, uh, a rotation so that this dependence is minimized. Um, and so we're, what we are looking very much into here <clears throat> currently is uh, additive quantization methods. And uh, additive quantization means that instead of having subvectors and you concatenate subvectors, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, lookup tables that span the whole vector to encode, and but you have several of the, those lookup tables and uh, you pick uh, one vector from each of the lookup tables, and you just sum them up. So, and then you 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 have to encode only the the ID of the vector that you picked in each each of the lookup tables. So it can be seen as a generalization of PQ uh, because if the lookup tables are zero outside of a sub vector, if each lookup table table is zero outside of a sub vector, then it boils down to doing PQ. Um, it's a generalization, so it has the potential to be more accurate. And the problem is, uh, what it, it's much more complex to train the lookup tables and to do the encoding. Uh, the encoding is uh, is not like just finding the nearest neighbors. It's um, it's a it's a combinatorial optimization problem uh, that that is NP hard if you if you want to solve it exactly. And so you solve it only uh, by approximations. And uh, so uh, and so basically we are. Uh, looking into how to do those uh, approximations efficiently. There are several uh, several directions for this, and uh, two of them are implemented in phase. The first one is uh, local search quantization, which is a um, which is a work by uh, from the PhD of uh, Julieta Martinez, and uh, that uh, that offers a good trade off uh, between uh, be- between the accuracy and encoding speed. Uh, uh, knowing that uh, that encoding speed c- cannot be, be as good as that of PQ, but it's still it's bi- based on the simulated annealing uh, from uh, with a random in- initialization, and it kind of converges into um, into a relatively good uh, additive con- additive quantization uh, uh, method. And the second one is just residual quantizers. So that residual quantizers means you use the you use a first level quantizer, and then you keep the residual with respect to the vector that you want to encode, and that gets you a second level quantizer, and then you encode it with a second level quantizer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, but if you do that in a greedy fashion, it's not good. And so in order to avoid to do this in a greedy fashion, you use beam search, and so, which is expensive. So again, there's a trade-off in terms of, uh, of uh, speed versus accuracy. Yeah, so that's... Um, that's a bit what we what we are currently working on uh, in phase. Uh, so currently, um, so just to say, so within uh, within uh, Meta, the, the the team, the core team that works around phase is uh, is about five people. 
Uh, not everyone is working full time on this, um, but it's that's that's about the the, the scale of the efforts uh, it's at uh, Facebook. Super cool, yeah. That, that was just a brilliant tour of product quantization. So much knowledge. Um, I'm also really excited in this WeVA podcast to welcome uh, Abdel Rodriguez to the WeVA podcast. Uh, Abdel is working on this kind of product quantization WeVA. Uh, Abdel, could you tell us about kind of where we're at with the product quantization and any questions you have for Matisse? So thanks, uh, Connor, uh, and thanks, uh, Matthias, uh, Matthias, for for the uh, nice uh, history and introduction. So I, I, actually, we are. Uh, very in the very beginning of the product quantization part now because we we have been uh, trying to improve the indexing algorithm and and ha and trying to make it scalable on when 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 we have more data well we we have we will have more requirements and and we we have to deal with it and we are currently experimenting with having some information on disk, some information on memory, and and the part that we need in memory, of course, is some representation of the vectors, and uh, we are currently playing a bit with the with the uh, compression of these vectors, and 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 again, we are we are scratching the surface here now. We we have a very uh, very simple implementation of uh, of PQ currently with k means and and segmenting the the vectors. Um, we would like to explore a bit uh, the optimized uh, product quantization, uh, uh, the optimized PQ next. And one thing we we have is one problem we have is that normally we don't build. Uh, so we, we don't have all the information and we build an indexing, but but we 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 normally build incrementally our our indexing, which means we need some some algorithms that could take over this uh, capacity to to add new vectors or delete vectors that you have instead of just building everything together. And of course, k-means could somehow be incrementally updated if you keep at least the number of clusters, which is uh, something that we uh, have. But uh, I'm also wondering about, in the case of op uh, the optim OPQ, this rotation matrix, uh, how 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 hard in terms of performance would it be to to make it also incrementally updatable? Uh, things like that. I, I don't know if you have some experience in this uh, direction, but it, it would be nice to to hear a bit about it. Sure. Uh, so <clears throat> I think it's a, it's a, it's an interesting and recurrent problem. Um, uh, what happens is that uh, so I think th there, are, there are two things to distinguish here. It's which is uh, an increasing database database side size. Uh, because uh, I mean, indeed, you add incrementally, you add more vectors. Uh, the the other kin, the other thing is um, is the di drift in the data distribution. Uh, drift in the data distribution is in addition to adding vectors, they have they have behaviors that you've never seen before and during the training phase. Um, I think the increasing uh, database size size is not necessarily a problem if you if you've had enough uh, data to train from uh, then uh, a tip, uh, to be to be very concrete a way I would implement a database uh, where you don't know in the beginning how big it's going to grow is uh, you accept the first 10,000 vectors you don't encode them at all you just keep them as is um, if you then you when you go to a million you you do some some cheap um, or some simple indexing, uh, say with HNSW, and then when it grows beyond that, uh, you and you start to, to to require some type of encoding, then you can uh, start thinking of uh, training a product quantizer or some or some other type of quantizer. Uh, but at that point, you have enough training vectors to actually 
actually, actually train it. So, so it, it makes sense to, to go to the, to go that path. Um, uh, which you, I mean, if you have 10, if you have, uh, 10,000 vectors, you can't, uh, 10,000 vectors use, no, I, it's, it's a bit too small to, to even train a product quantizer. So you would even want to have more. Um, the other problem is, uh, is, uh, drift in the data distribution, which, uh, which we observe also, uh, with some kind of applications. Uh, one, one funny anecdote maybe is that we, um, uh, we, we have, um, we have an indexing, we observe really a lot of data drift in, uh, in images that come in, uh, that come to, that are uploaded to Facebook. So I've worked together with people who uh, index those images and you have data drifts with memes. Uh, but also when there's a new Instagram filter that comes out, that kind of, you see a drift in the, in the type of images that you get. And, uh, and so, so it's, a uh, and, um, and the problem with that is if you, if you update the training, yeah, the, the main problem with any quantizer is that if you, if you update the training, then, uh, or if you do, for example, online k-means to adapt the sent rates of the k-means, then the, 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 the vectors that are newly encoded, they are not comparable anymore with the, the, the ones that were encoded before. And so, um, and so it, it's, it's not clear to me by default how uh, how to how to use those uh, updated uh, centroids so um, yeah it's, uh, it's something to think of yeah so when you have the online clustering you can move the mean but then you need to recompute the centroids is that like very basic understanding but uh, high level idea yeah it, it also depends i guess if you have more intensive changes in some parts you don't have to recode everything but that part's affected i would guess but hmm. so maybe we'll also transition to the topic of generally the wrapping the vector index around a library compared to a database and so maybe eddie and could um explain kind of the some of the features of the database and the distinction between how you're packaging up the vector index. So, yeah, sure. sure. This, I, I think we've, we've discussed this uh, before already in, in, in one of the podcasts, but it's, it is a recurring topic and we do see that, that coming up from, from users. Um, whereas I, I think one of the, the first and most obvious distinct uh, um, uh, differences that, that we see. And, and of course, Matthias, I'm also super interested about your perspective on this as someone who's been working on a library, because mine's a bit biased, of course, because I've been working on the on the database side. Uh, what, one that, that comes up very high on the list typically is this, this incremental updatability, which I think is not like this can be a library versus database part, but it doesn't necessarily have to be because HNSW, you can use it purely from a library perspective and it is incrementally changeable. Uh, something that needs to be trained beforehand. So for example, a quantizer that is maybe not as updatable. So in, in this case, um, the library versus database technical distinction doesn't so much uh, um, sort of determine of, of whether it's updatable or not, more that within the database, you tend to go for these kind of updatable cases. So for us, um, from a database perspective, typically what we say, the kind of UX that we want is the one that people know from non-machine learning databases. So if I just spin up a MySQL database, spin up a Cassandra database, typically I just start using it and I don't necessarily know what I'm gonna do with it tomorrow. I might update something, I might delete something, I might read in between, I might do that all concurrently. Um, and then of course you have to do capacity planning there as well. Um, and some databases uh, scale more dynamically than others, but this is a, a big part. So if this, this usage journey of using it, um, yeah directly basically uh, um, uh, or, or using it like a, like a database. But there's there's uh, way more. So, so one of the things, for example, that's also super important to me is the kind of durability aspect, failure recovery mode. So, so how does it react? So, so for example, something I think, and, and please Matthias, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, I think um, what I typically see in libraries for persistence is snapshotting, that you would build something and once it's built, you would snapshot it to disk and then you could load the, the snapshot. Um, whereas in, in a database, so such as VV8, for example, um, the, the update process itself is already persistent. So if VV8 crashes, I don't know, let's say you import 10 million and VV8 crashes at number 7 million, 
then you can just restart it and import 7 million and one. So, so this kind of incremental durability, crash recovery, um, everything that's written is written into a, a write ahead lock is, is a big thing. And then, um, and maybe this is also an, an interesting one uh, with face, because I think there's a, a, a separate library that I believe is not um, exactly face, but but built on top of face that distributes a, a face across multiple machines. And that is also something that's very big in the, in the um, in, in, yeah, for VV8 or for, for databases in general. So um, yeah, the whole scaling aspect is something that you get out of the box for free as well. That's that's my short <laughs> my short uh, overview of the the differences, but I'm very curious to hear yours as well, Matthias. Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, I think that Face explicitly uh, tries not not to go into the field of being a general purpose uh, library. So there are two reasons of that. The first one is that uh, I think that Face is already a very complex piece of software. Uh, if you if you would have to support that, it would mean that the number of code lines would be multiplied by a factor of three or something, which is not something we we plan to, to plan to do. And the second thing also is that in general I observed that uh, SQL databases are I don't know about VV8, but uh, very often databases have an order of magnitude storage more uh, than what's strictly required by the amount of data uh, that you have in this. For example, I've read somewhere guidelines that if you want to set up a MySQL database, uh, then you should plan for uh, five times as many disk space as what uh, the the raw data would use, and uh, this is something that face uh, we want to give the opportunity for people to you know use ninety percent of their RAM uh, and store a, an index in that, and that they don't wonder where uh, the about too much about overheads basically, and so uh, uh, and this is. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it happened several times that we are operating very close to uh, what's possible on a, on a single machine. And uh, for this, uh, we, we give up many functionalities like what you say, uh, being able to do uh, ID lookups, uh, being, able to, uh, being, being able to snapshot or this kind of things. And it's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the point. But definitely, I wouldn't recommend FACE as a, a final... Uh, production ready uh, database system it's it's really intended to be at the core of maybe another um, more broad scale uh, database system fantastic well thank you so much matthias abdel eddie and uh, such an information dense podcast so interesting learning about all these things thank you so much for your time yeah thank you thank you much. matthias yeah yeah thank you all yeah bye